Scott Galloway. Welcome to The Realignment. Thanks, Marshall. Good to be here. Good to see you, Scott. So before we get into your book, Post-Corona, From Crisis to Opportunity, which I really enjoyed, by the way, this was actually one of the books that I read before the show. doesn't happen always, <laughs> but that's a real testament to this. We wanted to give you a quick framework for what our show does and sort of get your thought. What we really focus on with the realignment is the idea that America is going through these big technological, economic, and political shifts, which we really sort of saw in the presidential election earlier this month. You're from Florida. You're in Florida right now. Obviously, if we're looking at the way the voting turned out, President Trump, while losing, performed surprisingly well in sort of working class areas and in certain parts of the Hispanic and black community, which goes to this idea that there's a broader shift towards issues of higher education and class away from this typical approach from race. So to start off, what are your thoughts on just this phenomenon as we're coming out these three weeks after the election? Well... So first off, let me just uh, you know come out as a a progressive. So everything has to be filtered <laughs> through the lens of you know I have a tendency to try and spin things to 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 our advantage. But look, it, it, the mandate that came out of this is no mandate. The only mandate you could see is that people didn't like the division and what I'll call the approach of the president. But if you look at the House races, the Republicans picked up seats. If you looked at state legislatures, the Republicans held or advanced. It doesn't look like we're, we mean progressives are going to make much progress around uh, in the Senate. Uh, we'll see what happens in Georgia, which is going to be the mother of all full employment act for every media property <laughs> in Georgia. As a, I mean, you could see a billion dollars going out. But anyways, uh, I think this election was one with 20 cents a cloth. And that is if the hmm. president had started wearing a mask early and said, look, you know, let's beat this thing. Part of that is wearing a mask. If he'd worn a mask and if he hadn't got the novel coronavirus, I think this would have been a landslide. Yeah, yeah. There's just no ignoring. He turned out a lot of people. And some of the, uh, Joe Biden didn't win this election. Donald Trump lost it. Uh, I think jo Joseph Biden is a good man. Yeah, I think he's the worst candidate to win the presidency in a long, long time. Uh, so this is the no mandate mandate. This All we can take from this is that America is unhappy about the way the novel coronavirus has been handled. 5% of the world's population, 20% of the world's deaths and infections. Uh, and they held the president accountable. But other than that, I don't think you can take away uh, – you know, there is no mandate here. <laughs> there is no mm – -hmm. You know, I don't think Democrats can say, oh, they have a mandate for single payer health care or free college. I mean, just do not don't go there because there was no there was no oh, we need to head to the Green Deal in this. People didn't vote green. They didn't even vote blue. They voted they voted the president out. That's that's the yeah. only thing I take from this election right now. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the funny thing is that you usually describe yourself on your shows as a raging moderate. So I'm interested in the progressive term today. Is there sort of a broader shift in your thinking or is this just sort of me nitpicking about word choices? I think I, I like to think that progressive or liberal means that you're open to new ideas and that you, you, you aspire. You believe that the definition of God is grasping beyond your reach and that the world isn't what it is. The world is what we make of it. And. Uh, you know, Republicans have a tendency to think that whatever good or bad comes from something is largely uh, a function of the behavior of the individual. The, and that individual has accountability and authority. And I, 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 there's an aspect of that I love. And then Democrats tend to think that no matter what happens, it's not a function of the individual, it's a function of the system. And I think the biggest mistake or the biggest danger uh, that, that, that Democrats face is that Somebody has decided that the our job is to be is to police cultural issues, and I just think that's where we lo we've lost the script. Mm -hmm. Our job isn't to disappear Al Franken; it's to figure out ways that ordinary Americans have better lives. To figure out a way that one in five households um, don't have that have kids aren't food insecure. To you know to figure out a way that all the incredible spoils of technology. Uh, are spread across a broader s selection set of companies and people. But at the same time, I think Republicans have had a bit of a, a knee-jerk, uh, almost angry at reaction that doesn't acknowledge that capitalism doesn't survive if it doesn't rest on a pillar of empathy. That capitalism mm -hmm. is not a society in its organic state. And that if there isn't a recognition 
that we're all in this together, that there is a brotherhood and sisterhood called America, and that if we don't, and I'll use the R word, if we don't distribute some income, it's just going to end up costing us more. So I think there's, and unfortunately, I think our politics, because of our electoral system, because of primaries, you know, there's just no space for uh, the common man. And as Lincoln said, God must have loved him. He made so many of them. But the majority of Floridans, where I live, Floridians, describe themselves as independents because they're so turned off of the extreme right and extreme left. So, uh, you know, like I said, I'm proud to be a raging moderate. I'm think, I think I'm where most people are, and that is I'm mm-hmm. somewhere in the middle. Yeah, it's it's interesting, Scott. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about just in the as, in the aftermath of this election is that I and maybe this is naive. I think the one thing that cuts across polarization is good policy, uh, which mm-hmm. is what you were re- referencing there. But to get good policy, you kind of have to know what the cleavages are in American society, where things are heading, and then you want to try and craft things for that. So one of the things you're most famous for is winners and losers, and I think that that's a common theme within the book. So let's talk about some winners um, from coronavirus. Who would you say are the biggest winners in the corona economy, a corona society, and more? Sure. So winners implies they've done something right. So I'll just, I like beneficiary. Let's call winners and losers. Yeah. First and right. foremost, the biggest winners are what I'd call story stocks. And that is our response to this crisis is that we have decided that, okay, losing Americans at a greater velocity, we're losing between 800 and 1,000 people a day. We're losing people at a great, there's a, the velocity of death here is unprecedented. We were losing two, 300 people a day in World War II, and you might well say, well, you have to adjust for inflation, losing 30 or 40 people a day during the AIDS crisis. We've never had this velocity of death. Arguably, mm-hmm. this is the most severe crisis of our time. And what I think our collective, if you reflect our, our, our spending as a reflection of our national priorities, our national priority says the following that a decline in the NASDAQ or a, a, a exceptional death, disease, and disability would be meaningful, but would be profoundly bad as a decline in the NASDAQ. <laughs> so we have figured out a way to issue stimulus that gets to companies before it gets to people, that gets to restaurants before it gets to schools. And the net result is, in the midst of probably arguably the worst crisis of the last century, the savings rate has never been higher. Mm-hmm. So what happens when all of a sudden a large population has greater disposable income because they're not traveling for Thanksgiving, they're not going out to eat, and then they get stimulus checks or their small business, their banker says, apply for it. And even though your business is OK, you get a million bucks in a quote unquote loan that's not a loan, it's a bailout or really a giveaway. I think a lot of that money ends up on Robinhood or E-Trade or Schwab going into the market. And since since the March, the market's only gone up, gone up. It's only been green. The rip back of 64% since the March lows has created this consensual hallucination that, wow, I must be a good investor. Why don't I, why don't I lever up on margin? I'm not getting any return in the fixed in fixed income in our money market or treasury. So I'm going to put more into the stock market. And boy, isn't this fun. My Tesla, my Apple shares have gone up fourfold and 40% respectively in the last five months. I must be really good at this and this is a lot of fun. And so the primary, I mean, the real beneficiary here have been what I call story stocks, where a company like Tesla that's sitting here in March was the second most valuable automobile company in the world, is now the most valuable and is worth more than numbers two, three, and four combined. Where Apple, who hasn't increased its earnings in 18 months or its top line revenue really meaningfully has doubled because uh, people want to go into the stocks that are, quote unquote, the disruptors. So I don't care if it's telemedicine or the four. If you had $100 in Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google at the beginning of the year, it's now uh, $147. You have $47 post kind of mid-pandemic. The other big winners from a market standpoint, um, other than big tech, have been obviously the pandemic trade. That's better to be lucky than good, the Pelotons, the Zooms of the world. But the other kind of beneficiaries here have been the big, and that is if you were to take the S&P 500 and splice it into deciles, the biggest 50, the next biggest 50, then the smallest 50. The biggest 50 are up double digits. The ones in the middle, down 10%. The ones at the very bottom, down you know, teens. And that is the market perceives that it's great to be an unregulated tech company, and it's also great to be too big to fail. Because if you're Delta Airlines, 
and you've spent 92% of your free cash flow buying back stock to juice the compensation of your senior executives, whose compensation is largely based on the equity price, and you've restructured several times, and then you hit a pandemic, okay, we're under this American company, and we employ thousands of people, and they wrap themselves in what I would call not even a socialist flag. Capitalism on the way up, where you privatize the gains, and then you socialize the losses, that's not socialism, that's cronyism. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a good argument for socialism. I don't think it's the right argument here. I think Americans are constitutionally incapable of socialism. I think we would skip right to fascism. But basically what's happening is we're seeing a level of cronyism here where big kind of companies like airlines that can wrap themselves in an American flag or restaurants. For some reason, we've decided restaurants are really important because there's a lot of famous people who are very likable that own restaurants and we can all relate to them. It's it, it, these companies are too big to fail, have asymmetric benefit to the upside. Well, I capture the gains, and when it's when it's bad news, I can call the government and get bailed out and protect the equity holders. So in the markets, the big winners are the story stocks and the companies that are too big to fail. In terms of an industry, if you want to think about big changes, um, well, let me back up. The other biggest winners are the top 10%. If you're making over $100,000 a year, there's been no change in unemployment, yeah. and there's a 60% likelihood you can work from home. If you make less than $40,000 a year, 40% uh, of those people have lost their jobs, and there's less than a 10% chance you can live from home. So you don't like, you don't like to say this out loud because it's cringeworthy. Uh, but if, if you make a good living and you have good relationships and you're, have, you're healthy – you have more Netflix and more time with your children and more money than you've ever had. Yeah. So if someone had showed up to my house seven, eight months ago and said, Scott, we want you to work from home. You're not going to spend 180 days a year on the road. You're not going to fly 250,000 miles a year and sleep in strange beds and eat shitty, buttery, salty food. You're not going to, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to be in New York, commute to New York, which is what I do from Florida every week. You're going to have more Netflix. You're going to be able to work from home. You're going to spend. You're going to go boogie boarding with your kids. Oh, and by the way, your stock portfolio is going to rip up forty percent. Like, okay, sign me up. And that is a decent description of the top ten percent right now. Yeah. And then the bottom ninety percent. The best description I would use, and I'll stop blabbering on, is they're vulnerable. A third of America can't pay their rent, and they kind of have to load up their igloo with their diabetes medication, their Diet Cokes, turn on the Uber app, and head out hoping to make nine bucks an hour and basically a payday loan against their car and put themselves in harm's way. So we have gone from a dysfunctional economy to a dystopian economy. Uh, so big, big winners, the top 10 percent, big, big losers, pretty much everybody else. Yeah, I certainly agree with you in terms of the end state. I guess I'm curious. Um, there's a lot of what you're talking about there, which is you know, anti-CARES Act, anti-stimulus. And the curiosity I have is around not just the restaurants, the idea of a Delta bailout and more, is it seems like we could have had, you know, the stimulus checks, like for an example. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of people who poured it into Robin Hood and bought like gaming sets, but there are also, I mean, drop poverty, right? To mm -hmm. one of the first substantial and first government programs to ever drop poverty in the history of the United States, modern American history. Same thing if we look at the restaurants. I mean, by and large, the restaurant failure in September, I think it was one in six restaurants. That mm -hmm. was a substantial number, which is gonna basically cause permanent job loss to spike. We have underemployment and so much more. So like, I'm not against, um, I guess I'm not against the stimulus checks going to people who are gonna put it in the market, because at the end of the day, to make something politically sustainable, it has to be universal if you also want to drop poverty. Same thing with the airline bailout. I mean, there's 50 to 100,000 people who work for their airlines. And then same with the restaurants. It just doesn't seem fair to me that any business required to be forced closed by the government of the United States or the government of Florida or the government of whomever should be forced to go bankrupt. I mean, that just seems absolutely immoral from a government standpoint. So I'm just curious your thoughts there because it seems like – almost like an austerity mindset of like, we have to pick mm -hmm. some and bail out others. What are you thinking on that? Uh, I think there's some, uh, a lot to unpack there. So some really good points. First, I want to acknowledge that you can't, we're in a crisis. You couldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. You had to get liquidity into the system. And right. the, the, the danger is you have permanent scarring and job loss and a real permanent uh, destruction of the economy. Uh, at the same time, and I'm, I'm quote unquote the progressive arguing this, somebody's <laughs> going to have to pay this money back. 
And if you think of money as nothing but the transfer of work and time, we are effectively transferring a lot of work and time from our children and our grandchildren to us. And the question is, okay, is it because we need to build bridges to the other side for companies that are good employers? I think there's going to be some very well-publicized examples of money that got to the cupcake bakery, a woman who employs nine people who are just out of rehab, and she makes a good living, and they make a good living, and we got to the other side because of PPP. I think as there's more scrutiny on PPP, we're going to find out that the wealthiest cohort in America, uh, small business owners, that a lot of them who welcomed these bailouts but didn't need them got the money, Mm -hmm. and that... The bet, loosely speaking, it was like, well, okay, what would you have done, boss? What I would have done is, in my view, uh, if you'd taken that $750 billion and said, okay, the bottom third of American households, the bottom 35 million households are the most vulnerable. Uh, I would have said, okay, with $750 billion, you can give each of them $20,000. And so I just saw a guy, a big, uh, Tom Colicchio, the restaurant owner, talking about, you know, they're all giving all this socialist bullshit. We're all in this together. And- <laughs> And uh, the restaurant industry employs 11 million people. And what kind of, first off, what kind of world? This is an exceptional shock. And in what world could this ever happen? You have to do something. Well, first off, uh, pandemics and crises aren't that exceptional. We, we've had them before. We had them with polio. We had them with the Spanish flu. They're exceptional in our lifetime. But what is more exceptional is an 11-year bull market. And the 11 year bull market has never happened before. And what it's done is it's wallpapered over a lot of businesses that didn't deserve to survive in my view. And rather than give restaurant owners, I would bet a third to two thirds of restaurant owners are multimillionaires. Rather than put the money in their pockets such that they could build a bridge, I don't think those are bridges. I think two thirds of those are peers. I think they're going out of business anyways, or they went right into the pockets of people who didn't need it who were already millionaires. I'll use an example, the Strand Bookstore. This yeah. is iconic. Do you guys know the Strand? Yeah, and, love yeah. the Strand. Yeah, but I know, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah, who does graphic? <laughs> it's it's wonderful, right? Every coffee table book I have, I used to when I was avoiding work, which I do a lot, or I would after class, I'd go just like browse around the Strand. I love it. Yeah. And, and a New York institution, what a gift! What a gift! It's a senator. Uh, I think it's Wyden. Senator I'm from Oregon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She they they estimate her net worth somewhere between fifty and hundred million. And she got a million dollars in PPP, and now she's asking the public to help her bail out. Quite frankly, the strand should go out of business, hmm. and it's a big loss. My question is, do you give those, those restaurateurs money, or do you give the 11 million people who are vulnerable working in restaurateurs the money, and then let them decide which bookstores and which restaurants stay in business? So in sum, I, I think where we've gotten this wrong is in America, we sort of personify companies, and we think of their death as tragic. No, it's not. Your mother-in-law, who's vulnerable and has asthma, when she dies, that's a tragedy. The strand going out of business is not a st- tragedy. So I think in general, where we got it wrong here was we should be protecting people, not companies. Small businesses mm-hmm. in America are the wolves of the American economy. They are vicious. They are adaptable. And they will come back where there's opportunity. They should also be allowed to go out of business. Uh, the reason why we're not France, the reason why we hire faster, the reason why we create small businesses uh, more easily than France is because we let businesses go out of business and we let people be fired. Now, does that say, does that mean there shouldn't be low interest loans? I, I would have liked to have seen PPP just say, okay, it's a loan. You got to pay it back. Zero interest, ten right. years, the most. But you got to pay it back because this is what happened. I own a small business. I started an online education company called Section 4. My CFO calls when PPP comes out. And says, Here's the paperwork. Sign it. We're first in line. Scott, you've raised a ton of money. Silicon Valley Bank loves you. We're going to get a quarter of a million dollars just for sending in this paperwork. And I met with my board. All my investors are wealthy. And we decided, okay, if the business needs money, then Scott is the entrepreneur. You're going to have to get diluted or... The investors are going to have to put in more money or the business is going to go out of business. And none of those things happened. And we never went for PPP. And I wonder just how many tens of thousands of businesses got hundreds of thousands, if not millions. I mean, supposedly a billion and a half dollars went to public companies, right? 10% Mm -hmm. of the businesses got 90% of the funds. So I like the idea of this. And I'm with you that government needs to step in and create a bridge. I wonder if at the end of the day, when there's 
when we do an analysis of this, what we did here was not so much build bridges for great small businesses that are good employers. What we did is what we always do, and that is we flatten the curve for rich people. Yeah. So I'm going to do the weird thing where I speak for rich people. We had your senator, <laughs> Senator Marco Rubio, on the show to sort of talk about the PPP program. And his sort of explanation of this was focused on the idea that actually we do owe those millionaires something and that the government at state, local, and federal levels has done things which has caused these governments to shut down, whether it's the 10 o'clock shutdown time, which is what DC is now implementing, whether it's the sort of general warning. So he basically is saying it's an equivalent of an eminent domain argument. And that at the end of the day, that's what it's owed for. So within that context, how do you think about the idea that as we're looking at winter and probable lockdowns, how should the government think about its relationships to those owners, to those companies, to those sort of decisions? So I'm not sure I buy, uh, first off, I look at it the other way. Hmm. Walmart and Amazon, um, their shareholders couldn't have dreamt up a scenario where um, you can buy, okay, we put trillions of dollars of stimulus in consumers' hands. Walmart is selling more, their top line revenue is where it was supposed to be in four years from now. They're killing it. Amazon's killing it. You, you put stimulus, trillions of dollars of stimulus in consumer hands. They're the two biggest beneficiaries of the two largest retailers. And then, oh my gosh, even better, let's federally mandate the closure of 98% of your competition such that if you want a beach chair, sunblock, and a boogie board, you can't go to the surf shop. You have to go to Amazon or Walmart. I would argue that there's more reason to implement some sort of additional tax on them than there is to bail out companies in this crisis because of closure. I think the argument that... You can't mandate the closure of something. I don't know. Did did we bail out companies in London when they had to turn their lights out, lights out because of bombing raids? This is a crisis, and I, I feel like something about our national character is really disappointing here. And that is, in World War II, businesses and people didn't have their hands out. We stopped driving sixty miles an hour. We went to thirty because we heard rubber was in short supplies because the Japanese are cutting off our supply routes. We planted victory gardens in case the food supply chain got got uh, interrupted. We reached into our mattress and took out money and we bought war bonds. We didn't have our hand out. And by the way, Marco Rubio never fails to disappoint. At some point, I imagine his testicles will descend. And he will do something <laughs> other than well, whatever. his staff listens to this podcast, so keep talking. Oh, sure. oh my gosh. <laughs> You want to talk about someone who's been just an extraordinary disappointment, who has shown absolutely no political leadership in every single thing that the senior senator from Florida does is focused on Iowa, whether it's missing votes representing Floridians in the Senate, whether it's cutting and running on immigration reform that ends up years later resulting in families being separated from their children. Marco Rubio, Senator Rubio has been has, has levied incredible damage on the state of Florida and the Commonwealth. Another talk show, hello to his staff, I'm sure they're good people. <laughs> the notion that we need to protect rich people, you know what, as one of them, we're doing just fine. And we've been killing it the last 10 years. You now have 12 families worth more than the bottom 60% of America. We have never seen this type of wealth accretion across the top 10%, much less across the top 1%. And you guys hear all the stats. You know, there's now there's now studies saying 1% of the population owns 80% of the wealth. Mm -hmm. That's not sustainable. And whether you think that's morally corrupt or not, take the ethics out. Whenever you get to these levels of income inequality, you know, <laughs> The good news is they self-correct. The bad news is the means of self-correction correct, are war, famine, or revolution. And right now, you could argue we have famine, we have pestilence. All our comorbidities have come have come to bear here, right? Basically, rich people are fine. If the the people dying here, I mean, when you think about why why it's a really interesting question. Why has our response been so incompetent? I mean, we try and say, you know, people. People will make excuses. They'll say, oh, it's because in Asian countries, they're compliant, which is basically Latin for their fucking pussies. That's what we're saying. We're insulting them. It's a xenophobic yeah. trope. Are Germans you know, compliant? Are Taiwanese compliant? The Taiwanese have had six deaths in a population the size of New York. New York's had 28,000 deaths. 
All of a sudden we've decided that, oh, it's our exceptionalism is why we're dying so fast. The, the results here have been so incredibly incompetent. We, have the, we spend more on healthcare than anyone in the world. We think of ourselves as being the most innovative place in the world. And you know, we like to think we have decent leadership. And this has been an unmitigated disaster. So then the next question is, why? And this notion that we have conflated freedom with discipline and national – or lack of freedom – or I'm sorry, we've conflated freedom with a lack of discipline and a lack of national sacrifice. The fact that we are obese as a nation. Also, if this virus had been a different color and worshipped a different god, we absolutely would have drawn together and come up with a unified response. But because we can't understand it because it involves this crazy thing we no longer believe in called science, we don't perceive it as a threat. Because, I mean, there are, this thing literally attacked our comorbidities because it's mm -hmm. primarily, primarily the demographic and ground zero for this are old people of color who are obese. Quite frankly, we've pretty much said we don't give a shit about those people. We're worried about the economy. I bet there's been more discussion and more stories about the permanent damage to the economy that this pandemic is bringing than what it is doing, the death and disease and despair it is living on households. I think we have totally lost the script around this. Exceptionalism in America now is a reconfigured Mack truck that's a temporary morgue. That's what American exceptionalism right now. I think there is really a lot of soul searching uh, that should take place after uh, what is nothing but nothing but in it, just a, a negligent and competent uh, Governor DeSantis, my governor, mm -hmm. on a smaller level, uh, other than the president, you know, there are a group of people. And I'll, by the way, blue state chancellor, chancellors of universities, inviting kids back to universities. Just so I want to be an equal opportunity hater here. I think these people are going to go down as levying more death, disease, and disability on America than almost any individuals in history. Anyways, bit of a rant. No, no. That, that's what you're. That's what you're here for. But so a couple <laughs> of things. That's a good pivot to the issue of Asia and American exceptionalism because I actually would disagree with you a bit. Yep. I think Taiwanese people and Germans actually are quite a bit more culturally compliant, right? Canadians? We don't have to treat that as. No, I mean, uh, t Taiwanese people and- No, but Canadians. Canadians have one third the per capita death rate. Are Canadians more compliant than us? Well, so th this is actually, that's a, that's a good, that's a good pushback. But I'd say that there, I'd say Canadian success could be put in a different bucket than yep. Taiwanese and German success, which is that in, let's say, East Asian countries, the success, you know, Singapore's in this category as well too. Singapore and they don't have a culture war. They don't have a yep. situation where yep. you talk about mask wearing and it becomes this whole issue. Yeah. I'm dealing with this issue on a personal level because my um, significant other's family is from South Carolina and a significant issue we've had is that they don't like mask wearing. And they Isn't think it that it's a blue I'm state. The same, I'm going through yeah. the same thing in my house. It's crazy. Yeah, this, this, is, a, this is a real thing. So yeah. that is exceptionalism. So I just, my problem here is that the second that all this comes out, it turns into a culture war issue. And I get your criticisms of Governor DeSantis and Senator Rubio, but there's half of our audience who's going to hear that and just say, there's Scott Galloway, ultra lib, saying ultra lib things. So that's what the American exceptionalism would be. Mm -hmm. So how do you just think about the idea of polarization and culture war? And how do we engage in these debates about sort of pushing those buttons? Yeah, it's just so disappointing because I think a lot of it comes down to I mean, there's so many culprits here. So let's 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 acknowledge that we all seem to find our way into our bubbles and find things that that feed our confirmation bias, and we move further and further apart. And we're more about embarrassing each other. We're more about, you know, we use the term principle to basically uh, substitute for dogma, and we don't find a collective common middle ground such that we can come together as Americans. And I think it's a lot of things. First and foremost, I think it's social media. I think these algorithms, there's a profit incentive to identify you as leaning left or leaning right and then take you further right, further left, such that they can give you red meat. It, I, within 10 minutes of me being on YouTube, they figure out I'm, I, I'm kind of center left. So they start <laughs> showing videos of people making Betsy DeVos look like an idiot right. or people being disparaging of Trump. And then if they figured out I was center right, they would have started showing, you know, the squad and how some that the Green New Deal is ridiculous, that they don't want lawnmowers and that they want to eliminate air travel. And before you know it, we're, there's just no common ground. We just show up to the party thinking they don't get it. There's no reasoning with these people. 
So I think social media is absolutely tearing at the fabric of our society. Uh, these algorithms don't lean left, they don't lean right, they lean down, and they figured out that engagement leads to more Nissan ads, which means enragement is the way to create shareholder value. Because enragement equals engagement equals more ads for Nissan equals more shareholder value, which equals more money for the most dangerous man in the planet on the planet, Mark Zuckerberg, and his lipstick on cancer, Sheryl Sandberg. So social media and media in general, by the way, that's nothing that Fox and CNN aren't doing. Mm -hmm. These companies are just doing, Facebook and Twitter are just doing it and Google are just doing it at scale, scale right? And, and making a lot more money off it. They figured out a way to the assembly line, right? You know, a deep, a deep fake of Nancy Pelosi on Fox is bad, but that's two to eight million viewers. It goes out, it goes to 200 million people on the less, less than, in less than 24 hours on Facebook before anyone even notices it. So one is a dumpster fire, the other is a nuclear mushroom cloud. Uh, the other is, I, you know, I, I, I think we have become really polarized because I think we don't share, I think whether it's kids segregating out of public or private schools, us moving into kind of our walled gardens. I went to a high school that was a third Latino, a third white, and a third other, and all different income levels. And I think there was a level of empathy we had for each other that made America stronger. Um, my best friend was a, a Mormon kid who was going to Stanford, and it gave me aspirations. And I thought, okay, he's smarter than me. He's harder working than me, but he's not that much smarter, harder working. So maybe I can go to a good college. So I had the confidence to apply to UCLA because Brett was applying to Stanford. My other friend, Ronnie Drake, was a black kid from Crenshaw whose father was a minister. And I remember him crying out of a football after a football game. He was middle linebacker where he tweaked his neck pretty badly. And he's like, the scouts are coming next week, and if I don't play well next week for the scouts, I, there's no, I'm not going to college. Mm -hmm. You know, that is, and I, it, it gave me a sense of empathy for like, Jesus, like college isn't a given for this guy, and he's probably got more talent than I have. Um, so I, I think slowly but surely, those mo whether it's people no longer going to movies, you know, weird things. I think slowly but surely we're segregating and we lack empathy. And I think the biggest source of that lack of empathy is that. If you go back to a time when things were better in the 60s and 70s, you know, so many of our leaders had served in one uniform. And the uniform wasn't red or blue. It was, you know, khaki or whatever. They'd served in the armed services. And so they all saw that country and God were the people they were serving as opposed to party. But just the division here is so ugly and so divisive. And I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think there's a cultural war. I think that the patriarchy, what I'll describe as the white patriarchy, uh, the general feeling is kind of a heteronormative society. It's worked. There's a really solid argument. If you look at the most productive societies in the world, whatever you want to call it, the white patriarchy, the white heteronormative, Western value, whatever you want to call it, it has worked better than anything else. And why wouldn't we stick with that? And then there's another side where demographics are destiny and uh, America, which is increasingly getting browner, you could argue increasingly getting more progressive across increasingly browner, younger demographics are like, you know what? What got us here today isn't going to get us where we need to be. And I feel that is the primary conflict in America right now. Hmm. And I, I wonder what is the, uh, the guy down the road for me is this guy, he has the best toys. He's the founder of Flex Tape. And I'm like, okay, what is it? He has some crazy polymer where you can you can attach any two items, right? You can attach a rock to That's peak a Florida business, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is. But he's like the most <laughs> successful company in Florida. He and Carnival Cruises in Disneyland are literally the three most successful businesses in Florida. Yeah, but I wonder, what is the flex tape of our society? Like at some point, we've got to get away from an obsession around race. In America, I think we're obsessed around race. In Europe, we're obsessed with class. Yep. But, but what is, and I don't, you know, it's easy to point out the problems, but I'm trying to think, what is it that gets us back on, you know, that gets that gets us from a starting place of America as opposed to left and right? Because this shit just is not sustainable. What, that's a good pivot into the media conversation, because I like your articulation of Twitter and Facebook's ad model as driving these conversations in a hyperbolic way. Something that has happened during coronavirus, and you didn't really talk about this in the book, is just the collapse of advertising as a business model for a lot of publications, which is driving increased interest in subscriptions. You're seeing places like the New York Times and Washington Post really conquer that sort of space. But something Sagar and I were really interested in was your articulation of the alternate model for media, especially relating to CNN. 
So you were talking about, you know, put a paywall in front of it. And I was sort of a little curious how that would work because it always has sort of a cable bundle. But I know you have thoughts, Sagar, so please follow up on me. Yeah, I was just fascinated by it because it's, I remember I, w- I was listening to you talk about, you're watching CNN and they had the best people, but you know, as somebody who works in news and like I have my own news show and um, election night, like I was watched by a million five people or something, is that the whole point of it was that it was open to anyone. And so I was like, hmm, this idea of putting hard news behind a paywall, I mean, the whole reason that you have hard news and live news in particular is so everybody can turn it on at those exact moments. Like the 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 crappy, shitty part about CNN is all of the hours in between the election nights and, you know, the COVID mm-hmm. press conference. It's the in- analysis or whatever. That's kind of where if you have a real strategic advantage and you're independent, that's where you can cut in. This is just speaking from my own personal experience. I just I'd love to hear you think about that, about news behind paywalls, especially live TV news. So if you think about if you think about kind of a brief history of the news in America, it used to be a place that was a, you lost money, but ABC said, okay, we're going to take some of the money we make by running Tang right. and Chevrolet commercials during the Brady Bunch and the Partridge Family, and as a social service, we're going to have Jerry Dumphy, uh, an anchor in L.A., give you kind of the news. And for 27 minutes, we told you about the news. In the last three minutes, we brought on two partisan people to argue. And, you know, point, counterpoint. Remember that? Jane, you ignorant slut, right? Remember that yeah. that whole point? That used to be three yeah. minutes of the news. Now yeah. it's gone to 27 minutes, and the other three minutes is just hardcore, boring yeah. facts. Right. And it's because CNN and Fox figured out, all right, entertainment is either novelty, The Queen's Gambit, amazing show, by the way, you should watch it, or it's- Love it. Or it's it's hardcore news, which is kind of you know brightens up a, roo- a room by leaving it where everything has been fact checked and just the facts and have you know Judy Woodruff kind of giving it to you as it is. That shit doesn't make money. And the problem is we figured out all right, if we mix facts and novelty, we engage people, and we can sell a lot of ads for opioid induced constipation or diabetes <laughs> medication or the Calm app because you're so pissed off and so or tense. Or gold, gold. <laughs> yeah, or one eight hundred Belizean real estate or, uh, or, or you know, I, I can't stand those apps for the Calm app. I watch the Situation Room. I mean, first off, the Situation Room. What? There's a situation. There's a situation every day. Every day, Think Scott, about that. Every single every day. day, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then they run an app saying you need to calm down. I'm like, Jesus <laughs> Christ! <laughs> just, just, just tone down the news. And you have yeah. advertising. You have it's tied to the clock, so they got to keep you engaged. They got to give you a lot of crap. So novelty is totally swept over it. And if you think about media, media is nicotine. It's addictive, but it doesn't give you cancer. Mm. The stuff that gives you cancer is the tobacco. And the tobacco of news is advertising. Because the ad people at CNN and Fox and ultimately the algorithms figure out that the way you keep people engaged is with opinion and and tickling their tribal sensors. You know, if you look at my my CNN app, it says, you know, uh, I forget I forget, you know, Don Lemon calls out the secretary calls out Peter Navarro. It's like, okay, that, that's a story that Don Lemon is disgusted with Peter Navarro, right? And then, yeah. and then I, my Fox app, uh, which I download because I, I, like to, my, I like to go, you know, like any, any part of the resistance, I like to go behind enemy lines and I still have go a problem, Fox. Scott. You should stop downloading these apps. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. I need the comm app. Issue. The third app should be the comm app. <laughs> that's my problem. Trust me, that is, yeah. that, that, if we're going to talk about my problems, you need a bigger boat. We need a three hour <laughs> show. But, and then I go on Fox and it's like, you know, Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin mocks Barack Obama. You know, you just, I'm supposed to tune in for that. Uh, or Sarah Obama calls out, Sarah Palin call, b- calls out Barack Obama's hypocrisy. It's like, you know what? We're in America, the president, you know, we're supposed to respect them. Anyways, th- th- this shit has just gotten so out of control <laughs> that where do you go for real news? So the evolution of news has moved to a profit incentive where advertising has become. Uh, the tobacco that gives us cancer, but I blame I blame the profit incentive around news. So, what I would like to see happen at CNN is I never used to like this, but I would like to see 
a guy like Mark Benioff. I mean, basically, billionaire Republicans buy football teams. Billionaire Democrats tend to buy media companies. And I look at yeah. what I look at what Bezos has done with the Post, and I think he's done a decent job. And I look at more conservative families that have purchased newspapers. And I think you know, what? generally speaking, they have a conservative viewpoint, but they're responsible people. I think the news should largely probably be owned by benign billionaire Democrats and Republicans because when it's a pure profit incentive, it just the shit comes off the rails. It just mm-hmm. comes off the rails. So I don't know if there's some sort of I, I don't know what you do in the middle here. I think the Wall Street Journal now is seen as the most trusted moderate source source of news, which is which is really interesting because it used to be very conser- considered very conservative. But uh, the news the news has a, has become a little bit of a menace. I absolutely love CNN. I'm addicted to it. I watch 40 hours over about Oof. five days. No one. I wish someone would touch me the way that John King touches that multiplex <laughs> collaboration screen. Um, but I went back and forth between Fox and um, CNN and MSNBC, and I thought, oh my gosh, there's just got to be a different source. And then my New York Times app, there's got to be a different source of news. But news is... We're at a weird point here with news. What do you guys think? Well, yeah, I have a question on this actually, because if there's someone who's thinking, well, I wouldn't say he's thinking deeply about this, but um, Axios reported that as President Trump is thinking about his sort of next steps, Trump TV will probably be a thing and it would be subscription paywalled. So I'm just curious what you think about that. Let's take off your political Fox News, CNN, Calm Hat, and just sort of think about the way news is evolving with this paywall model, because it's actually very interesting. The right has actually done a pretty good job of creating these subscription, non-advertised based systems. There's CRTV, which from which joined with Glenn Black's The Blaze. There's Newsmax. There's a variety of them. And what they're able to do, and this is why I'm skeptical that CNN would be successful from a paywall perspective, they're able to activate conservative identity politics and sell something. For example, News Newsmax is doing this disgusting grift right now where they're saying, we're the only conservative news outlet that hasn't called the election for President Trump. And one of our friends pointed out, you guys don't even have a decision desk. So you can't even, (laughs) you guys can't even technically call anything. Right. So I just, (laughs) yeah, there's nothing there too. So yeah, but they got 800,000 viewers, right? Like they just popped to 800. That's like a CNN level audience. I mean, the last thing I'll add too on that is look at Substack, right? I mean, the top 10 Substacks are all, I'm, I'm not going to say they're conservative because that's obviously ridiculous, but they're dissident, right? Like they're dissident voices. So it seems like the leaders in the news business and the commentary business are people who are outside the mainstream. And so I question just like why the mainstream would change up their economics. I mean, one of the things I had somebody who's very high up in cable, makes millions and millions of dollars a year telling me this. He goes, you know, I'm actually very proud of cable because we're the only business um, who doesn't have to rely on Google and Facebook. So we will never give that up. It's like they don't have an incentive in order to make a change because they're like, look, we're making money hand or fist. I mean, as far as I know, Fox Corp is set to make $2 billion, like next year. So there you go. I mean, in profit, just off of Fox News. So... My compromise, so let me be clear, I hate Trump. I absolutely hate the man. I think he's a terrible (laughs) father. Um, I think he's dumb. Uh, I think his only saving grace for us is that he's stupid. Dick Cheney was much scarier because Dick Cheney was very, very smart. I think Donald Trump is dumb. I think he's alienated our allies. I think he's emboldened our enemies. Uh, I think he's an expectant rich kid. I just the man makes my skin crawl, so we we have to put that. Mm-hmm. So there's that on record, Don't on record. So <laughs> yeah. I, I always thought, typically, I think of him as kind of a strong man, where it's this narcissism, never relent, never apologize. Anyone who crosses you, call them a horse faced slut that will never find another man. An exact quote. Um, and and people are very drawn to that strength, that novelty, that charisma, if you will. Typically, typically. The end is not a good end for strong men. They end up in a field being executed with their wife, Ceausescu, or hung upside down naked with their mistress, Mussolini. Strong men or or or, or, or mild strong strong men light, a Berlusconi, who's kind of like basically said, all right, get out of here. They typically aren't like Jimmy Carter, where they go mm-hmm. on to have really positive post. You know, Jimmy Carter, in my opinion, a mediocre to bad president who goes on to be this revered post-president. 
it usually doesn't end well for the strong men. Now, having said that, I'm in Delray Beach, Florida. I go down to Atlantic Avenue. I see 2,000 people in a spontaneous march the, the steal the vote. Uh, stop the steal. S- stop the steal. Yeah. And I look at all these people and I think, okay, most of them are in their 50s, mostly white, driving kind of five, seven-year-old uh, you know, RAV4s or American-made cars. I'm like, you know, this guy has such incredible charisma and following and passion. Huge. It's just, there's just no getting around it. I'm not around those people, but you can't ignore it. And so I thought, well, maybe I'm just confirmation bias. I, I kept saying it's going to be dropped like second period French. I think I'm wrong. I think the guy's going to be an enormous force. So the question then, the second part of your question is, how does he monetize? I, I, I think that's all he's about is money, period, beginning, end. That's it, money. And the question is, well, how does he monetize it? The whole world is moving to iOS or Android. And that is, you can get a phone for free, a ma- more processing power than the space shuttle. It's called Android, and it's basically for free. In exchange, we're going to molest your data set. We're going to pull 1,200 points a day, and we're going to treat you as an organism to be kind of mined. But there's tremendous utility. And by the way, two and a half billion people go, that's a good trade. Molest my data. I don't care. I have nothing to hide. If you want to serve me ads for Adidas or you want to know that I'm in California so you can serve me ads on United Airlines, have at it. I love this phone. What a deal. So I don't want to to pretend that those people, you know, there's anything wrong with that trade. The other trade is iOS, where basically it's you're only going to pull 200 data points a day, more privacy, more signaling. I'm a storyteller. I can afford to pay $1,100. For five hundred dollars with the sensors and chip sense, that's an iPhone. I think it's essentially a luxury item that attempts to make you more attractive to other people. The whole world is going iOS or Android, and I think that the reason why a subscription model for Trump doesn't work is I think he's Android. I think mm-hmm. he's going to have to go ad supported. I just don't think they're the, 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 his followers are the people cutting the cord. I think they're the people that still have the cord and are still watching Fox or angry that Fox isn't right wing enough. The content that goes most viral, the niche content you're talking about, the apps, those are pretty niche. For him to service 75 million people that voted for him, he needs to go Android. He needs to be on Fox 2 or a new station that gets cable carriage that's ad supported. He will, I'm not even sure CNN can support itself on the ad model. Because when you start talking about get, asking people to turn their credit card out, their litmus test is I get a billion dollars of content for every 86 cents I give to Apple in terms of Apple TV Plus. I get 240, I get a buck for $1.20. Netflix will give me a billion dollars of content. So that's kind of the litmus test if you want me to pay. And mm. to date, people really haven't registered how much it costs to have ads pelted at them. They haven't done the math, which is really striking me. If I, kind of one of my professional role models is Fareed Zakaria. And I did the math, CNN or Time Warner or AT&T gets 21 cents for interrupting that gorgeous content with 10 minutes of crap. So that's basically saying, they're saying, okay, Scott, your time's worth about a buck, a buck 20 an hour. So the business model doesn't work around ad supporting, but people continue to endure it. They don't. I don't know if it's because it's hard to take out your credit card because yeah. micro payments aren't built into web browser. I don't know what it is, but I. Uh, so one, I want to acknowledge the point. I think there's a media company in his history. I think the worst thing, the the likelihood, the biggest risk there is he has not proven himself to be a good operator, despite what he pushes out in the press. I've lived in New York or lived in New York for the last 20 years. I worked with his daughter's company. I knew people who worked in his company. I, it was his reputation among business circles was that he was a really mediocre operator, that these were not well-run businesses. They had huge turnover, that he was very good at marketing and figuring out a way to put no money down, put his name on a building, and get two, three, ten percent of revenues with a small staff that he didn't pay well, that was turned over fast. You guys are running a small media company. Running a large media company is very, very difficult. So if he were smart, the first thing he would announce is that he was hiring like, I don't know, some amazing media operator, right? Get the guy, Justin Hines. Yeah, or Justin Hines, who runs runs Bloomberg Television. Mark Burnett. 
Burnett. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, an operator. I mean, that yeah. Mark Burnett is, strikes me as someone who's just an incredible creative. But someone who has run a media organization, because uh, that is hard. But anyways, long story short, I think it's ad supported, not mm. um, I think it's ad supported, not uh, not um, uh, not subscription. That's just not their user base. So we're at our last question here. We have not hit higher education, which is really a space you've been particularly distinguished in during coronavirus. And it's been floated that one of the first acts that President Biden will pursue could be forgiving $50,000 worth of student loans for folks. I'd just be curious what your thought on that would be as sort of an opening salvo, because we should talk about the future. We've litigated Trump for four <laughs> yeah, years. Right. What's this hit last uh, bit? Is, what does the future I, I, look I'm like? I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed that uh, I fell into that trap, which I always do. So let's talk about higher ed. So a lot of my brothers and sisters on the left are are talking and promoting or pimping the idea of, well, first off, for higher education, pre-education, and then debt forgiveness. Terrible ideas, terrible ideas. Hmm. If you think about, and I wanna be clear, I am a fan of some sort of targeted student debt relief you served in the armed services, you go practice medicine or uh, I don't know, delivery or essential work in a warehouse in, a, in an area that they're having trouble getting people. You wanna teach in a public school. I, you are making less than a certain amount of money and have a lot of dependents under the age of 10 in your household. Fine, targeted debt relief, I get it. But wiping out debt relief? What do you say to the people, and there's millions of them, that have sacrifice. They don't take vacations. They bought a, an eight-year-old Hyundai, not a, not, a, not a new Accord, so they could make those debt service payments on their student debt, and they just paid them off, and then you're gonna wipe out debt? This is every bailout, that's a bailout. That's not, that's not debt reduction or debt targeted debt forgiveness or using the government's balance sheet to bring their interest rates down. I think there's a lot of things we could do to reduce the burden of what has been this unethical transfer of $1.6 trillion from middle class households to higher ed. But I don't think I don't think you wanna bail out an all around forgiveness because it creates moral hazard. I don't care if it's the bailout of long-term capital management where the counterparty that got bailed out was Bear Stearns, which ultimately ended up taking the entire economy almost down, or if it's the bailout of Chrysler in the 80s that only led us to, to bailing out the other two companies in 2008. These bailouts create moral hazard. What's the point of really being a consumer and saying, you know what, maybe I shouldn't borrow $60,000 to go learn how to be an esthetician because I'll probably have to pay this money back. Debt, you know, it sucks to be a grown up. all right? And I, I don't wanna say, what we have done has been, I think, immoral, but I think if the government comes in and bails out the debt holders, you're just setting us up for more bad decisions and a bigger bailout down the road. I do believe in targeted forgiveness. I do believe in ways to bring down the, those, the, the cost of that debt service. Now, the really bad idea is free college. And I teach at a university that charges $58,000 a year. We are drunk on exclusivity. We've raised prices 1,400% over the last 30 years versus everybody else. Uh, we brag about rejecting 85% of our applicants, which in my mind is tantamount to a housing shelter saying they turned away or bragging that they turned away 85% of the people who showed up last night. It's, it's absolutely, we have lost the script. We're no longer public servants, we're luxury brands. Mm -hmm. But what we need is, we need to embrace technology to dramatically increase admittance rates and dramatically bring down the cost such that yes. it's affordable or within reach of everybody. But if you were to make college free, this is all we do. And this is what we continue to do in this country. And the Democrats doing unwittingly, the Republicans do it strategically. That's nothing but a transfer of money from the poor to the rich. Who's in college? Mostly upper middle class and rich kids. 88% of the top quintile income earning households send their kids to college. 8% of the lower quintile send their kids to college. So you wanna make it free? I mean, that's nothing but the full, that's nothing, that's literally like, okay, let's give put money in the pockets of rich people. Rich people should be paying $58,000 to send their kids to NYU. What we need is, we need NYU to face the same economic pressure the middle class households and every other business is facing right now, lower their costs through what is one of the most expensive guilds ever invented, tenure, start ex substantially expanding their capacity by taking a third, a half of their classes online. I teach 280 kids. 
on a Tuesday night. They each pay $7,000. That's $1.96 million to listen to me do this for two hours and 40 minutes via Zoom for 12 nights. That is ridiculous. It is morally bankrupt. Now, if some kid has the money or his parents are willing to put him through NYU for that certification, and by the way, it's still a good deal. It's still a good deal. But what we need is the opportunity to take kids who are the, uh, you know, raised by immigrant single mothers who lived and died as secretary, yours truly, and let them go to UCLA undergrad and Berkeley grad for a total tuition of $7,000. I had to take it as cheap as that was. I had to take out student loans. I had to work all summer. It's not your birthright to go to college. I should have worked. I should have had student loans. But it was attainable for me. It was within my grasp. And right now, it's becoming out of grasp for everybody except two cohorts. One, the rich, right? And two, yeah. what I call, I would affectionately call freakishly remarkable kids from middle and lower income households. And I can mathematically prove to you that 99% of our children are not in the top 1%. So we need to go back to where higher education was in the 80s. And that is that it should be the ultimate upward lubricant for middle and lower income kids. And now it's just become the engine of casting where we rub Vaseline over the lens of the fact that rich people go to college by letting in these freakishly remarkable middle and lower income kids. Higher education institutions should be subject to the same financial pressure as anybody else. You wipe out debt, you make college free, there's no financial pressure on them. We continue the drunk on exclusivity bullshit that riddles higher education. Every decision higher education institutions make in the top 100 is all with one aim. How do administrators and tenured faculty reduce their accountability and increase their compensation? The reckoning is overdue. We have stuck out our chin and the mother of all fists, COVID-19, is coming for it. It couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. Bring it on. Love it. With that very optimistic note, uh, Scott Galloway, <laughs> thank you for joining the podcast. Thanks, Both Scott. Marshall and I are big fans, so thank you very much. And everybody go and check out the book, Post-Corona. Thanks for having me, Tom. Thanks, Scott. Absolutely.